Hey, everyone. Uh, in this episode, I'm joined by McGee Clegg, founder of Cleartail Marketing. Uh, McGee's doing a lot of interesting work for his more complex clients right now, and we're going to get some tips from him on how to execute campaigns more effectively. Uh, and also, we're going to talk about how to communicate marketing wins to clients in ways that they'll actually appreciate. Uh, we're going to talk about things like effective use of chatbots and some practical tips for customer re-engagement. Uh, we've got a lot of things in this episode, so I'm pretty sure you're going to enjoy it. Let's get into it. So let's talk a little bit. Um, so founder and CEO, uh, you came along and, and, you know, you're specializing in B2B and yep. uh, specifically with sort of a bent towards the manufacturing industry. So I was kind of curious, like, how did you get into that? What brought you, what brought you to yeah. this point? Yeah, it's a, it's a funny story. I, um. So I started the agency in t at the end of 2014, actually. Um, my background was actually film. I, I have a master's in film from USC, actually. And um, I was doing a lot of commercial work and documentaries yeah. and things like that. And I randomly got this gig for uh, this company called Case, where they're a huge uh, manufacturing company for construction equipment. And we went in and I had just done this uh, three-part series about a teenage werewolf uh, for Subway sandwiches. And I did that project uh, for the CMO of Subway sandwiches. And then I did this project for Case. And yeah, Case was just a much more interesting project. They had a much, uh, yeah. yeah, it just seemed, you know, the, the B2B side was kind of this market that was just kind of lacking attention from a lot of uh, agencies that were out there. And so we kind of dug further into that and realized that there was a huge need for digital marketing with a lot of um, these companies like Case, and they didn't really have a handle on it. So we just started exploring other options, and that's kind of what led us to SharpSpring. And so initially we got in and just started um, doing SharpSpring setups and helping people automate their marketing as well as um, you know, figure out which campaigns are working and do a lot of other interesting things with the software. But since 2014, SharpSpring's grown in a lot of different directions and it's a much more powerful tool to this day. And I think it's one of the best on the market and it's one of the most cost-effective as well. And so it's been a really core offering uh, for all of our clients that we work with. And we try to implement it with everyone that we have uh, campaigns running with so that we can better understand what's working and what's not. And that's led us to... 2021, where uh, we're a much bigger company today and a full service yeah. digital marketing agency. Yeah. So I love what you just said. Uh, I just want to go back real quick, and you want to, and you talked about how like what's working and what's not, because I think um, y you know I've been having these conversations with marketers. I've just been getting these kinds of questions, especially you know fourth quarter. Everybody's doing budgeting. Everybody's saying I need more budget for 2022. You know, they're going into that budgeting process and saying, how do I justify the spend and how do I bring that to the table to the CFO so that, you know, I can get more budget to go and do more things that are contributing. And, you know, so I'm kind of curious, like, how do you, with your clients, you know, the same thing happens, right, for agencies, right? So agencies come along and they say, okay, you know, we're helping you in all of these different ways and we're connecting that to, you know, sales pipeline, driving revenue, you know, for the sales team. Um, and like, I'm just kind of curious, like, how do you show what's working and what's not working, like visibly or, you know, like, how, how do you describe it or articulate it when you're in those kinds of meetings with your clients? Yeah, it's a great question. So first off, uh, a lot of reasons people come to us is because they're having this problem. And and the biggest thing is what I find interesting is, especially with B2B companies, is a lot of times these companies have become successful without really understanding how marketing works. And they're heavily reliant on <laughs> their sales skills and also their sales team. And then they yeah. kind of get to this revenue level. I usually find the revenue levels over a million going up to even like, you know, I've seen people at 20 million that don't have this organized as well, which is kind of yeah. interesting. And so what yeah. happens is, um, They've been heavily reliant on an excellent sales team, uh, building those face-to-face -face relationships, as well as excellent customer service and referrals. 
and they've gotten to a great revenue point a lot of the time. And now they're really ready to expand for whatever reasons or goals that they have. And so what I find is they either have um, an agency that's kind of inexperienced, that's motivating them to spend money in a variety of directions, or they have a overstaffed marketing team that is, you know, I've seen incredible budgets for a group of people that aren't doing very much. <laughs> and, um, and they're really yeah. confused on, hey, yeah. why aren't we growing? And yep. if we're spending all this money in this direction. And yep. so the easiest thing to do, um, and the easiest thing for a lot of business owners and executive teams to understand, and this is unfortunately where a lot of focus goes, but it is kind of the easiest transition to identifying this stuff is, um, hey, where do, where do our leads come from? That's the easiest thing yes. to um, digitally. So it's like, you know, you can set up a Google ads campaign, a Facebook campaign, social media, you can set up email yeah. marketing efforts, you can set up outbound lead gen strategies, uh, yeah. SEO, all this stuff. And that's yeah. really easy to identify. And so the first, and that's why SharpSpring is such a wonderful tool is because anything that comes in digitally, we can track it right away. And we could, we could point to that customer that got acquired and then converted. And yeah. we could say that person came from this campaign. How much money did they spend with you? And we could point yeah. to it and without SharpSpring, it's really hard to do that. And, yeah. but that takes that off the table. That's the easiest first step that you can take is just campaign attribution. Where are these things yeah. coming from? How do they get in? And let's just take a look and have a real conversation. It's not a gut feeling. It's, this is what actually happened. The, yeah. the other thing, the secondary thing, that's a little bit harder to comprehend for um, a lot of clients that we work with and companies in general is. Um, there are secondary marketing campaigns that are taking place. And so it doesn't, a lot of times someone will be, get acquired through, you know, just coming in off of an ad, downloading an ebook, and now they're on your email list. Well, how many emails did they receive before they made that transaction? How many touches yeah. did they get yeah. with retargeting ads yeah. through SharpSpring ads platform? And, yeah. and that is a huge way, not only for first uh, transaction, but yeah, we've done a study where we actually look at, okay, we have a monthly email going out with this client or a weekly email going out with this client. How often do the people on the monthly email or weekly email buy versus people that are not on that email? And we found yeah. consistently, if there's additional transactions available, it's four times more. And, but that's really hard to point to. What's the value of yeah. that secondary yeah. campaign? So that's yeah. kind of what we do. We do have an analytics program where we actually do connect those those two things as well. Yeah, so I, it's I love that you're saying that because I think this is an area where so many agencies can learn uh, from you know this kind of this kind of approach because what what ends up happening and you know I've I've said this on LinkedIn and and a few other places and you know podcasts like this one where you know. I, I tell the story about this marketer who was running uh, her, or sorry, an agency actually that was running a a series of campaigns, and um, she was clearly seeing results from it. But then when she got to the, you know, what I'm going to call the decision making table, right? You had your executives there around a table, and they were planning for you know an upcoming year, and you know, it was continually, she was getting, you know, pushback about her budget. And she finally got to the point where in the meeting, she literally just pulled up SharpSpring and then showed it up on the, you know, on the projector, I mean, on the screen saying, hey, look, here's how these four or five campaigns that we've been running this last quarter have contributed to this much pipeline and this many closed one deals. And those closed one deals are closing at higher win rates and they are actually compressing down so that your sales velocity or sorry, pipeline velocity is sped up, right? All of those kinds of Amazing. things. And you could literally, like, she was just telling me, like in the, in the, in the podcast, she was telling me, uh, in the episode where like their mouths were just sort of like, like open and stunned because they didn't understand. And what's really funny, I don't think I ever mentioned this in the other episode, but what was really funny is, is, is she said that the sales leader thought it was their sales team just getting better. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. But, I hear that but, all the time. Yeah. yeah. Sales team is exactly the same. They're exactly the same, but the lead quality was better. 
they were closing at higher win rates for, because, you know, of these campaigns. And that shifted the whole dynamic for, you know, for her as an agency, because they were actually starting to including, you know, to include her in these conversations strategically sort of as a partner, you know, as opposed to absolutely external cost center. So yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. There's a, I've been in a lot of conversations as well. There is this dynamic, especially in B2B when it comes to sales teams, because uh, a lot of times if, yeah. if the sales and marketing is not communicating, there's, there's a lot of confusion, but oh, uh, yeah. the, the sales team, like their whole goal is to stand out and show that they are bringing in the business. And the more that they can isolate right. themselves is that breadwinner, yep. um, the more value that they have. So that's their entire play. So if you can't connect it and get everyone on the same page, you will definitely yep. run into sales teams that want to take credit for absolutely everything. And it's, uh, absolutely. it's, it gets confusing. <laughs> yeah. For, for anybody who's listening, who's in sales, I love all of you, but he is absolutely true or like absolutely right in the fact that you know, there's a, especially if the, if, you know, in, in manufacturing, this is usually the case, right? You can probably speak to this better than I can, but they are usually sales led organizations, uh, mm -hmm. by and large. Right. And so, uh, depending on the size and, you know, you know, very large, you know, transaction, you know, uh, size and, you know, sales team tends to nurture those things, you know, and they, they sort of, you know, it's, it's kind of like attribution with Google and Facebook, you know, both of them want to claim the sale. Well, the same thing happens with sales teams, <laughs> you know, the theories of marketing that's been backing up, right. And nurturing those leads all the way through to yeah. where it becomes an opportunity. It's, you know, it's not magically, you know, they become the opportunity, right. There's a right. lot of work that on it <laughs> under the covers. Right. So hundred percent. That's cool. Uh, I love that. That's awesome. So, okay. So this is sort of a, like a high level kind of questioning, yes, but I, you know, I'm kind of curious what your take on it is. Mm -hmm. So what is sort of the biggest change to you in the marketing landscape over the course, you know, since you started and where you're at today? Like what are, what are the biggest shifts that you've sort of personally found most challenging and interesting? I feel like in, in my experience, I feel like it's just gone. Hold on, actually, someone's calling my phone. One second. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me just turn no this problem. off. All right, there we go. All right, I think we're all good. Okay, let me jump back into that. So, in terms of the biggest change and shift that I've seen since starting this company, twenty fourteen, um, I find it's become easier to have these discussions, um, especially in B two B, because back then it was. There was very much this idea that, you know, there's so many times I'd get on the phone with people trying to um, encourage them to explore these digital marketing opportunities and how important it is. And I've heard the line so many times like, yeah, we, we're just focused on boots on the ground and relationships. <laughs> and, um, and that was overwhelmingly the conversation back in 2014. But as yeah. of today, I've seen a huge shift of people being more open-minded and it's, it's really interesting because sophisticated marketers uh, that I'm friends with, that I talk to, um, they're usually, you know, working with people that are already, you know, well advanced in these efforts and these types of strategies, or they're working for companies that are, you know, kind of demonstrating what you have to do to be a successful digital marketing company and running campaigns. And a lot of the best marketers just aren't at the majority of these companies in the United States and all over the world. So it's, it's interesting to kind of step into these conversations with people just that are not there yet. Yeah. And I find that, um, as of today, it's, there's definitely more, um, of, of the people that we're speaking with, they're much more educated, they're much more curious. And I think it's also partially because, because it's becoming more competitive and to get in front of customers. And there's just a lot going on that people are struggling to wrap their heads around. But I'm finding that the biggest thing is just open-mindedness to these strategies and trying to dig in and understand it. And it's it's really fun. It's a lot more fun than it was back in 2014, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think that that's a really good segue because I mean, it, it, what it does, you know, like I'm all about trying to take I, I, so I'm a huge proponent in saying like marketing should be responsible for revenue, right? At, for the organization holistically. And, you know, so, you know, 
that means we have to do more as marketers. And, you know, we, other than, you know, the way I'm, I'm going to say, you know, 2014, you know, it, it was create a bunch of leads, MQLs, toss them over the fence, right? Sales picks them up and runs with it. Mm -hmm. Whereas today we don't have that luxury anymore. Right. And there's still a lot of marketers that are doing it. A lot of agencies that are still doing it. But those are the ones that are having such a hard time right now because they're not showing how they're contributing to, you know, pipeline creation and, and revenue. And looking at it holistically, like if, if you do end up having that view, what you see is those are the agencies in my experience that, you know, I've been interviewing a lot of them here recently um, that it's the constant theme, right? Like they're showing the holistic, you know, full funnel. Uh, approach to driving revenue and how they're, you know, how they're contributing. Those are the mm -hmm. ones that are seeing the most success. And I don't think that is by chance, right? That is something that is directly correlating to the, um, the reporting that they're showing to the, to the leadership board, you know, to the leadership around the table, as mm -hmm. well as, you know, to their, to their points of contact within the organizations. Like that's, that is the driver. Uh, Absolutely. Being. So, so, yeah, to find that right. just another line on that, I, I do find that there is you you do have to be able to show exactly where it's coming from if you're going to have a good relationship with your clients. Because you know, back in the day, it, it did seem like there was a lot of agencies that were just like, "Oh yeah, go out, do this, this, and this. Just spend a bunch of money here." But you know, it's just working and believe us. Uh, you know, a lot of people would just focus on like impressions or clicks or, you know, traffic to the site mm -hmm. without having any way to identify what's actually coming through and, and closing into a transaction. And now that yeah. that's the expectation. If, you, if you're going to have a long lasting relationship and do a good job as a marketer, you have yeah. to be able to pinpoint that. And that's why Sharp Spring is so powerful and why you need it. So uh, yeah, again, I mean, I think that, that, theme is, is really like one of the major differences. I think it also struggles, uh, marketers tend to struggle when it, um, when they can't show it, right. The, when the opposite happens, when they're not empowered, they don't have their reporting so that it, it gives them that story that they have to create and then, and then present, uh, and, and be able to show trend lines in the right directions right? On a consistent basis. Like those are all things that are sort of like basic table stakes today that, you know, is really, I think, um, necessary. And, and if you're, this is just my experience. I don't know what yours is, but I'm going to maybe flip it around and ask you here in a second, maybe mm -hmm. like an anecdote or story or something. Uh, but there are lots and lots of really great tools out there, right? Tons of them out there. And when I'm saying tools, I mean things like, you know, email builders and chatbots and, you know, um, lead lead capture form, you know, all, all of those kinds of things uh, um, that are great uh, individual tools. The, the challenge that I have seen is that those tools, by and large, were not made to work together. Right. No matter right. what we sort of want to believe, um, you know, and hope, <laughs> right. There's those tools definitely don't like they're, they're built to do one thing really, really well. And yes, they have integrations, but those integrations in and of themselves are not sort of all they're cracked up to be. And so what you end up with is sort of disseparate pieces of information for these different tools that then you have to patchwork together to be able to create the the picture and the story that you want to be able to, mm -hmm. to communicate to leadership, right? And that requires somebody on staff, you know, somebody to sift through spreadsheets, normalize data, like put it all together and then create something that is usable and, you know, things that you can, you know, you can actually um, be, make business decisions from and, and, and make, uh, make your case for. Uh, have you... Have you experienced that or, you know, like when you're working with clients, because typically you're inheriting a lot of the tech stack or whatever it is that they're using, you know, when you mm -hmm. work with a new client. So just kind of curious, like, do you have a real life story from something like that? Yeah, especially on, on chatbot, for example, um, 
you know, we, we, since the sharp string came out of the chatbot, we've been implementing it with a lot of our clients and a lot of them had other solutions. And, you know, there, there's other elements that have been uh, segmented as well that we've collapsed into. But I think the chatbots are really just kind of a nice story on on how it's just, you know, what is the point at which it's advantageous to have a separate tool and when it's not? And many times I'll find that there are clients that we're working with that have some sort of live feature because there's also this mentality, especially with uh, other generations that are some of the older business owners that that I work with. They they're okay with the idea of a chatbot being on there, but they want someone to be manning that chatbot and they want someone to be there interacting with that person. And you could do that with SharpSpring as well. And you definitely have that feature. But what I find is, well, then there's this whole fall off. If you have another tool out there, it's like there are leads being collected and then that requires somebody to move that into SharpSpring or it requires an automation to be set up to move that into SharpSpring. And yes, there might be some advantages to people that are folk solely focused on chatbot software, but, but what is the advantage? And is it worth the potential of losing a potential opportunity that might be worth uh, thousands or millions of dollars in some cases? And in my opinion, I think that there's not one software out there that's going to hit everything on the head perfectly, but you have to focus on the main drivers. And yeah. I think the sacrifice of having uh, things segmented and not communicating correctly or the risk of something not coming into the main um, data center hub where all your contacts are is pretty dangerous. And in terms of a uh, potential missed opportunity that, that could happen along that, along that path. And so, yeah, we, we always, uh, encourage everyone to do everything that they can on SharpSpring. And, um, another, another common thing is we'll see CRMs. Um, there's, there is a, a big conversation as well as, uh, well, this CRM has this, this, and this, and it has this type of reporting and we need this exact thing. And then a lot of the times these guys go out and they're not even using the CRM. So they have like 60% of the users aren't really logging what they need to be logging. And then, so they have this whole separate CRM that isn't communicating with their marketing. It's just yeah. like, so, you know, let's talk about reality and let's talk about yeah. like what's actually going to yeah. happen. But ideally yeah. we can have all of your contacts in one place and attribute the marketing yeah. to where it is. Yeah, I, I love that because I, I mean, I talked to a lot of agencies and that's, that's sort of the same story where they will, you know, they'll have a, a scenario where, you know, they've inherited something that's sort of duct taped together uh, and it, and it really doesn't give them everything that they need to be able to, you know, make like campaign decisions. I wouldn't say like necessarily in real time, but quick turnaround kind of decisions, you know, like just even having reporting on a. Uh, a more consistent, uh, at a consistent level on a consistent base, you know, is much more important than having a hundred percent of the bells and whistles, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, I think you're probably right. Like there's, there's like three or four things you need to do really, really well, you know, in terms of customer touch points and yeah. have that data in a, in a way where you can see it holistically, uh, through what we call the lifetime, you know, the life of the lead. Right. Where, you know, those multiple touch points are all leading towards the prospect towards a, 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 you know, an opportunity created or a closed one deal. And I don't, um, I, I have fundamental issues with, with attribution modeling. Um, I, I'm, I believe this is just my own personal perspective, not anybody else's. But my, my personal perspective is, is that attribution is flawed if you want to use it sort of as a single source of truth, right? This is the thing and, and there is no wavering from it. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, execs would really love that to be the case, but in reality, it's not, you know, the buyer journey is not linear. It is, you know, it's more like this, right? Where, you know, it's coming... It's coming from multiple dimensions, multiple channels, uh, multiple touch points to be able to develop uh, somebody, uh, you know, a prospect into an opportunity. And mm -hmm. I, my, you know, I, I think marketers who've been around a while know that and they, they, they have instinctually sort of like created marketing that leads to that. The, the problem that they have is justifying it. Mm -hmm. The problem is that they have, you know, around channel, like when you go and, and try to do attribution by channel, things like paid social make no sense, right? But yeah, right. 
we all know paid social is a huge driver of awareness, right? right. And, and, you know, that upper funnel or even mid funnel type of activity. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of curious, like, do you have clients right now where you, like, how do you handle that? Right. So how do you, when you're talking with yeah, great client, question. yeah, how, how do you handle that yourself? So, so generally the way it goes is, you know, a lot of people that are coming to us, they, they have no idea what to do, right? They're trying to figure out what they're currently spending. Is it working? Um, they're also trying to figure out like, what do we spend on as well? And, and how do we know to trust that? Yeah. So generally what I like to do is focus on things that you can get clear lead acquisition from at first, take a step and to build trust. Because if you try and, you know, some people that are sophisticated marketers or sophisticated owners that have done this stuff before, they, they just know what they need to do and it's fine. You could do a larger level program at that point and just jump into it. But those are really few and far between, um, pretty much non-existent, very rare. And especially kind of when you're in this one to $10 million range for B2B, which is usually when people are approaching us and so what, what I like to do is let's just focus on the key avenues for digital marketing that are actually going to acquire customers that lead to conversions. So those elements, a lot of the time, dependent on the product. I mean, like um, in manufacturing, yeah, Google ads and SEO and those types of channels work very well. And you can quickly get to a point where you're getting lead conversion into sales opportunities, which do close. And then from there, once you have the trust on that, then you could focus on, hey, let's do some secondary marketing campaigns, which are basically, hey, email marketing, retargeting ads, and social media paid social as well to get that awareness and exposure, which goes towards people that are interested in the category, but also people that have interacted with your, with your ads already and your website. And that allows them to see an extra boost that these conversions actually start, you know, doubling and tripling. And then they start to see how this all kind of fits together. But that's generally how I approach it. Um, you have to show them something that's tangible and understandable at first, if they have no experience with how this world works, and then move them towards the more looser versions of it. And then you could point to the transactions and the growth as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think to me, yeah, that's, that's one of the things about the life of the lead that I like it, frankly, is just the, um, it gives you those multiple touch points so that you can start drawing pictures, you know, or drawing conclusions as to what the things are that's actually driving, you know, driving somebody initially, because it's going to get, it's going to end up getting captured in something like a Google campaign, last click attribution or Facebook or whatever. Right. But, um, you know, the, that's where it sort of shows up. Right. Um, but, but what happens above that, that creates that, you know, that, that outcome. And it's funny, I actually did a, uh, I did an experiment, uh, on our, on our own website, as a matter of fact, uh, where this is probably, I want to say it was like 60 days ago where I added a, like, how did you hear about us form, uh, and left it right. open ended. And I specifically asked like, where did you hear about us? And, you know, and, course you know there's always like you know my my cro folks are like oh no 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 more form you know no more fields yeah, but yeah. um in the but what i you know we, we kind of just swapped out another field that really didn't matter and you know everybody was kind of happy but it, it, <laughs> at the end of the day what i was looking for in that how did you hear about us was they're in the customer's own words where, what was the driver that brought them to, you know, to my site, to my, mm -hmm. in this particular case, the request a demo page. And what was fascinating to me, McGee, was the fact that, um, I, I, I'll have to, I'll have to pull up the numbers, but I think it was like 38 or 40% of the people that filled that thing out came from channels that my Google Analytics was saying was direct or organic or, you know, whatever was mm -hmm. captured and sort of that last click. Mm -hmm. And that's fascinating to me where they were really coming from, you know, word of mouth, colleagues, you know, referrals, you know, mm -hmm. other agency news say, oh, this is a, you know, this is a neat, you know, platform. You should check it out. Uh, you know, 
they go to different jobs, you know, because everybody's moving jobs right now. And so mm -hmm. they go to a new company and they say, you know, I used this platform before, like all of those kinds of things. And, you know, none of them, like that's 38 to 40%, something like that, that, yeah. you know, were completely sort of misattributed. Mm -hmm. And and that is where we get ourselves into trouble, right? When we sort of go after the things that we can 100% measure, uh, we end up limiting the pool that we get to fish in, right? Right. So, our head, you know, our, one of our sales leaders, that's what they, you know, they, they sort of say that they're like, you know, look, we want, we want to be able to fish in a bigger pond. Right. So we got to work on, you know, uh, expanding the size of the pond. Uh, I like working with sales leaders that think like marketers. That's fantastic. Uh, and so, you know, that's, those are, those are conversations that, that we tend to have. So anyway, that's great. That's cool. Yeah. So, so switching gears, I guess. Um, so marketers today clients you know they're busy right so and they're always going to be busy they're always going to be wearing multiple hats they're always going to be under budgeted um it's just sort of you know par for the course as a marketer we're always you know you know uh, under you know under resourced and and super mm -hmm. super busy so how do we sort of cast a light on the net net underlying problem that you know, makes our lives as agencies or, you know, our lives as, as clients, you know, just a bit easier. Like what are the things that we can do that you have seen, let's say over the past year where like, where you've seen marketers doing it right? Right on. Yeah. So first off, depending on your budget and what you have, um, I think, and I think it's difficult, just like you said, there's going to be uh, marketing directors that are in place that are struggling to get more budget. I mean, uh, I, a lot of marketing directors that we work with in the beginning, they, you know, when they're asking for more, more budget, I think the leadership will say, well, that's why we hired you. Why aren't you doing all those things? And, um, and I think that, uh, it's like, it's like lawyers, <laughs> lawyers that you bring on as in-house counsel. And then they say, Hey, I need all of this external resources to actually work all the stuff. And everybody's like, well, why did we hire an in-house counsel? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just like, all right, guys. Yes. You know, so it is hard. I mean, marketing directors get attacked a lot and, uh, yeah. you know, it's really, really hard to prove value. So I think the first step of anything, if you ha don't have a lot of resources is let's just get some basic things in place. And that's why I think having a tool like SharpSpring first off is mm -hmm. going to put you in a great position because you as an individual can put together an email campaign, which we know is going to educate your audience on what you are offering and additional things that they might not know about that you're offering. And that's going to lead to direct conversions that they will see. Um, you can also handle all of your content writing out of there, social media, blogging, everything. You can easily put together landing pages without having a, an external programmer that you need to be yeah. paying hourly for. You know, yep. all these things within SharpSpring, it's going to save you a ton of money um, and also give you the tracking capability to show what you're doing is actually having an impact. And so if you don't have a lot of resources, that's literally step one. And if you don't know how to operate all of it, you have to start understanding and educating yourself through <laughs> the help documents on SharpSpring and, and do what you can on that front. And then once you have a few things working, then I think you'll have the ability to convince them to give you more budget. But the, but the key drivers, I think, is, you know, you, you're going to have to figure out where your audience is hanging out. Um, you know, a lot yeah. of people just assume sometimes that, oh, it, it's on Google. Well, I, I do have examples where Google just isn't where potential uh, customers are. I mean, they, it, not everyone, depending on certain industries, is looking for their uh, service or product on Google. Sometimes they... Yeah. You know, I've seen clients in B2B that are, that for whatever reason, get no traction there. It's because, you know, someone's going to some sort of association, uh, in-person yeah. meetings to, to find those yeah. types of partnerships. And, you know, we have to understand what those are and hopefully you have a little bit of a budget to experiment, but that's step one. Let's find the biggest driver of where we can get the cheapest exposure, uh, for potential customers. And then let's make sure that we get all of their contact information that we can and set up a system to do that. And let's get them all on some sort of email list and start engaging with them and tracking if they come to your website or not. And then from there, once you get some acquisitions, you'll definitely, uh, and conversions, you'll definitely have some budget available 
to go ahead and invest in other opportunities. But I think that's that's the leanest and meanest way of uh, kind of starting it and approaching it to start gaining trust in whoever holds the bag to um, expanding yeah. your budget. I, I love that approach because I think that's, you know, you at the beginning of that response, what you what you said was, you know, do the stuff that you can do, right? Don't wait on somebody else. And the way that I would, I would sort of look at it if I was going to parachute into a new business, right? Or I was going to bring on a new client. Uh, let's say if I was, if I was an agency, I would, I would come in and one of the first things I would do is just take a look at how the handoff process is being done between marketing and sales. And I would look specifically at the areas that uh, specifically like how we're routing leads within whatever system we're using to, to get the sales team, their leads. I'm telling you between just basic conversion rate optimization on site for your, get a demo or your free trial, if you're product led, you know, or, or maybe it's, you know, talk to a sales rep if you're, if you're, you know, different, but, um, that right there is a huge opportunity just kind of getting that, getting that right, getting it optimized. And then the handoff process, once somebody submits uh, to a, you know, a lead to a sales team, you know, and you know, like I've seen, I've seen examples that are really kind of scary, right? So that, you know, it'd be like the, the lead routing takes three, four days to get to somebody who's to actually talk to a sales rep. Oh yeah. You know, from, yeah. from the time and nobody knows in the organization, like the person that did that thing, they're off to a different job, you know, new person's in, they just sort of status quo, nothing changes, three to four days, you know, for a customer to actually talk to somebody. They're already on another free trial with your competitor, or they're already talking to another rep with your competitor, right? Yeah. And you've lost opportunity. Just fixing that one thing, I've seen 30, 40% improvement in mm -hmm. this one deal, right? Yeah, and, no, that's a that's a great one. Absolutely. We've yeah. got a lot of work like that. And, and it's yeah. crazy to me, like they're, they're, and you know, it's smaller companies, uh, you know, even like, yeah, I've seen smaller companies, just a few people that are feeling these things, uh, you know, it goes to one person's yeah. inbox, like sales at whatever.com. Yeah. And then, they're yeah. just like, oh yeah, we got this person who, you know, yeah. uh, comes in part time that then makes sure yeah. that those leads get to the right person. I'm like, all right, well, that's the first thing, like by department yeah. or by location, by zip code, even you could even break this down and assign and distribute leads automatically. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's super important. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it is super, uh, like critical that you get sort of the routing, right. Get it done up front, you know, and most, most companies don't have real strong marketing ops. Um, you know, on the smaller side, I, I, I think I should mm -hmm. say, right. So the smaller, you know, smaller, smaller companies sub 10 million, let's say, you know, on mm -hmm. the, you know, really light on that. And so you have, you know, a couple of marketers maybe that are trying to wear all of the different hats. Yeah. And what ends up happening is, is that's the, that's something that tends to get overlooked because they're focused on campaigns and getting something mm -hmm. out the door and, you know, doing, doing things like that. When once they hit the site, you know, they've already sort of pre-qualified, they've already raised their hand and said, I want to, you know, I want to see this thing you have because I think it might solve a pain point I have. Like, those are the best things you've got. And, you know, mm -hmm. you got to treat those things like gold. So just, you know, just doing that and then taking that win and sort of, and then sort of moving it into other types of campaigns, like, as you were talking about, like with Google, for example, where, especially in B2B, most, most marketing, you know, centers around trying to create more awareness like using Google, which is really more of a sort of a capture tactic when people are already in market, when they're searching for something with intent, right? As right. opposed to, you know, spending, you know, a bunch of money and a bunch of dollars on trying to drive, you know, trying to drive traffic from people that have zero intent, you know, mm -hmm. they, they're coming to the site and, you know, obviously they're high bounce, that shows up in the way of high bounce rates and sort of low quality leads that you're getting, you know, to a form. But spending more of your time just narrowing the budget down, <clears throat> I know this sounds like it goes against uh, against logic, but in my experience, like if you just take Google, which is sort of what I'm going to call an intent, you know, should be an intent focused channel within B2B anyway, 
Mm -hmm. narrowing that down to only the things that are really super, super high quality keywords that, you know, like high intent keywords, like, you know, um, my platform plus pricing, you know, those kinds of things, right. You know, that's super, mm -hmm. super targeted. And then take that extra budget that you're cutting out that didn't really generate closed one deals anyway, can probably generate a lot of form fills, but you know, most of that stuff's not ever going to make it to a demo attend or to mm -hmm. a deal, right? right? What you do then is you sort of look at it and say, okay, well, there's a larger pool of money that I just cut out. Let me go and apply that to something that actually can create demand where my pond is bigger that I can go and fish in in the subsequent months. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny to me, like marketers, like I hear them all the time. Like I'm, I'm always like, I don't know if I've ever heard of a marketer that's told me that they have too much budget. <laughs> yeah. Those don't exist. So, you know, my thing would be like, just take 30% of the budget that was going to, you know, a channel that was never creating deals anyway. Mm -hmm. Now you've got 30% that you can experiment, show what's working and then go to leadership or CFO and say, look, this is what's working. Let's, you know, if we had, you know, twice the budget, I could generate this, right. And, and start creating business cases that where you're talking the way that the CFO talks, you're talking the way the CEO thinks, right? Mm -hmm. And you you get into a position like that and all of a sudden it's amazing like how the purse strings kind of loosen up a little bit and you can focus on larger initiatives. So, absolutely, you know, I, I, I think, yeah, I think you and I are sort of on the same page there. It's, um, yeah. There's actually another, another thing that we've been doing as well, which is kind of interesting in regards to like, you know, what will be where, and, and sometimes this stuff is difficult to pinpoint as we've been talking about this whole conversation. But one of the things that we'll do also, especially in the B2B space is, you know, there's, there are transactions, a lot of these, uh, where, you know, in most B2B companies you work with, they're not subscription models. They are, you know, one-off big transaction and then smaller mm -hmm. transactions throughout the year. But there's an expectation for, you know, a a certain type of account that's going to be buying, you know, three, four, sometimes 12 times a year. And, but they get into a frequency and either they increase that frequency of purchase or it slows down depending on how that business is doing. But one of the things that we'll take a look at really simple. So if there's any B2B people out there with this type of business model, this is uh, one of the things that we help implement. Um, but what we'll do is we'll take a look at has that frequency of transaction fallen off? So mm. what that generally yeah. means is, uh, and there's a variety of products sometimes there's, you know, a million SKUs in some of these businesses, but you know, has, have they stopped purchase purchasing that one item for some reason? And that's a signal that that customer needs to be re-engaged. So what is the marketing tactic that we take to re-engage that customer? Is it an email? Is it a follow-up call? Is it a calling campaign? And then what is the impact of that effort as well? How many customers do we bring back in to start purchasing that transaction again? Um, and those are little things that, you know, people just kind of overlook because so many people are interested in client acquisition, but really yes. a lot of the money in B2B is take care of your current customers, retain them and make sure if they're falling off that you, uh, identify why and, and get them back in gear to start, keep working with you. I, yeah, I think that, so just. Yes, absolutely. Re-engaging, uh, taking the people that had interest and bringing them back to a point, you know, because not everybody is in market. That sort of goes back to what we were talking about before, right? You know, just because they had interest in, in one moment doesn't mean that they're going to be in market, um, you know, for, for uh, you know, the following week or the week after, right? Something has changed in that dynamic and having a way to be able to talk to them is, is a, you know, in a, in a way that they want to be communicated with, like, and that could be content or, or something else that, uh, you know, just keeps them, you know, in, in a, in a stream. And I think more than anything else recently, what I've seen is uh, something I said earlier, which is people are job hopping right now. Right. And because they job hop, you know, the, uh, that point of communication from, you know, maybe they're not in, they, maybe they don't have budget or they've already got a software vendor or they've got a product already in the existing company that they're at today, but they move companies next month. And all of a sudden 
all sorts of doors open up because they're looking for new software. They're looking for new vendors. They're looking for new, you know, solutions to something. Uh, and they have budget, uh, which, which is key. Yeah. Right on. So, um, so I like that, uh, like one of, one of the things we were talking about how, like, what are the most successful marketers doing right now? And, you know, one of the things that it kind of comes up for me a lot that I hear is most of the time we, we talk about revenue, like it's an additive thing, like driving revenue is an, is an additive thing. And, you know, I, I'm thinking like, you know, new channels or new tactics, you know, new head count, new software, new whatever. And I think there's probably truth in that, but in my experience, like growth really tends to happen when you start removing impediments. Right. And so like it was described to me once, like, you know, it's a tree that's trying to grow, you know, in the woods and, you know, you have lots of other trees that are around it and lots mm -hmm. of other, you know, life and it's in the shade and, you know, the nutrients are being drawn from it. And that tree has a really tough time growing, but if you cut back some of the underbrush, you cut back and you, you fertilize a little bit, all of a sudden that tree, you know, starts growing. And I think that kind of happens here too. Right. So if the, the, those impediments tend to act like friction that really slows down the pent up growth of an org. And, you know, I, I think, you know, those are, those types of friction pieces are pretty easy to spot, right? So you, know, you mentioned one earlier in the episode, you said sales and marketing alignment, like that's a huge one, right? When these two teams really don't talk the same language, they're not measured in the same way. Like they're not compensated in the same way or, you know, their same definition of success really is, is completely different. That doesn't, that, that's a form of friction that keeps the organization, you know, constrained for lack of a better word. Other examples would be like, you know, examples with, uh, you know, your messaging, right. You know, your, your ICP, you know, you're, you're sort of maybe singing a little bit off key. You know what I mean? When I say that, like you, your messaging is messaging is not hitting quite right. Mm -hmm. Um, that creates a form of friction because you're not speaking the right words, you know, to, to your prospects, um, mostly Absolutely. in their own language. Right. Um, you know, cobbling, like we talked about this one, like cobbling together those different pieces of the MarTech stack, right. Where they're not talking to each other and working together. And, you know, you've got marketing ops over here spending half their week just generating reports for your leadership meeting next night or whatever, right? But you're like, oh, yeah. that stuff, because you're, you're sort of brute forcing those things to make them all work. Um, you know, analytics, you know, not, you know, not talking to each other across the different platforms or different channels, like all of that stuff really kind of slows things down. Um, and it's painful, right? And they're, they're, it, it slows down decision-making. It slows down, you know, like the ability to jump on opportunities when you can, like all of the real things that really help you grow. So, you know, my one piece of advice I, I think would be just be ruthless about removing those impediments and growth, you know, really does tend to follow. So I, I don't know what your take on that is, but I think it's, it's just, Every organization has those things. Like, I don't know of an, I've never been in an organization that doesn't have at least two or three of those five things I just mentioned. And, you know, it's, it's like, what are the things that we can do as, you know, as agencies to help organizations see those kinds of characteristics and then help provide solutions. Right. And, and, and we do it through our marketing, right? I mean, not every one of those things is basically marketing related. Right. But most agencies really struggle having, you know, with having those kinds of conversations to be able to help. And then ultimately, you know, obviously that, that helps you as an agency as well, because you, you kind of get that credibility in the relationship with the, you know, with the leadership on the, on the client side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, um, in terms of that, like what we try to do is, um, we try to work with the sales team as much as possible. And we also try to remove, uh, any transparency issues. So one of the things that I like to do is just 
first, we all have to agree on the, the approach and we have to rationally understand why we're going to go do this thing <laughs> in any, in any sort of campaign. So having the entire leadership team, um, if you're working directly with the leadership team, it's having them on board and then making sure if you're working with the marketing director that they have the tools to convince the leadership team that this is the route and that everyone clearly understands why we're taking these steps. And then, mm -hmm. and then so, and then it's understanding, okay, if we're going to do this, you know, what are the KPIs? How do we know if this is successful or not? And I also That's think, a good one. yeah, and I also think that, you know, having those as well, it, it improves the relationship because, you know, sometimes um, we'll walk into situations where, you know, we don't know where customers are hanging out. We don't know where, what the best acquisition channel is. And so, you know, it's not that we have this one strategy that we're going to force into some organization because this is what we do as an agency. A lot of the times yeah. we're trying to understand what is the best thing for the clients that we work that we're working with to get them the most cost effective leads and then increase the frequency of transaction at the lowest possible cost. And that's our goal. So we need to set up, what are the KPIs to tell if something's working? And it's not that this relationship's over if one channel doesn't work. It means, just like you said earlier, we got to take that 30% of the budgets that are being wasted on these channels that are not working and then allocate them to the correct channels. And let's do that in an objective viewpoint together. And let's set the rules so we can all make decisions together on the same page. And let's make sure that if we're generating leads and from a marketing standpoint, if this looks like it's working, well, let's talk to the sales teams and see how those conversations are going because we can have people calling you all day, but you know, if they're not who you want to talk to, this is pointless. And so like there was one, uh, one client that we had a conversation with at one point and, you know, there was a, there was a mixed bag of, um, of leads coming in and one was the exact type of lead that they wanted. It was the exact type of company size and everything. And then the other group was just they wanted the same thing, but it was an industry that they didn't want to work with. So, okay, well, how do we remove that? So we don't waste time with those leads. Yeah. And that's yeah. why you need to talk with sales because you can show conversions and you look like an all-star, but you need to make sure that the sales team likes your leads as well. And they're having successful conversations. <laughs> I love that. I love that. You know, it's, it's absolutely true. Yeah. There's no, you know, there is no hard line anymore, right? There used to be maybe, but there is no hard line anymore. It is, it is all the way across the funnel from beginning to, you know, from ad impression all the way through to close one deal. And, you know, that kind of mentality, I think is what, you know, what the most successful marketers today are really doing. The most successful agencies that are supporting those marketers are doing, um, which I love. So, so what, um, so what's 2022 sort of look like for you and you know, the agency, like, what are you, what are you guys doing? Yeah. So what we're trying to do is, uh, as an agency, you know, our biggest goal is we want to build deeper relationships and really become a chief marketing officer, a fractional chief marketing officer for the companies that we're working with. And, you know, we're, we're generally focused on, uh, jumping in with groups that are business owners that have made it past or up to the million mark or the 10 million mark, then they might have a marketing director and they want us to come in and implement a holistic marketing strategy that actually drives revenue and we can actually point to what's working. And so just, you know, a lot of times people will come in at different levels. Maybe it's just, hey, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm uh, cautious about spending money on marketing. I've been burned by other people. And so what we, what we do is we just have an open hand to, hey, we'll start at any level. Let's take a step together. Let's build some trust and then once you trust us, uh, we can show you how some of this stuff can really drive your business. And, you know, one of the most rewarding things um, for me this year was we've been working with this company. They're doing like 1.5 million when they started with us or just over a million, kind of in that range. And, you know, I just got this wonderful video testimonial uh, about a month ago. And yeah, I didn't, you know, and basically we, we grew this company 278% within a 12 month period. And I was just like, wow, like this is amazing. And, um, you know, really, you know, and their investment for that, it's not very much. It's, you know, we're talking like, you know, a total marketing budget of, you know, $5,000 a month, you know, it's an incredible return, a few million dollars <laughs> out of, out of some simple strategies that we can help people implement. But, you know, that's what we want to do. We want to come in and yeah. uh, over deliver and help our business owners 
that we're working with reach kind of this level of freedom and excitement in their life to improve their family's yeah. lives, their lives and their employees' lives and, and grow to whatever level they want to get to. And, I, um, I, yeah. That's I would be saying. shouting that. I, that's amazing. I, I think I would, I'd be shouting that video testimonial across, you know, from the rooftops. And... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're about to, we're about to get that launched uh, out there, but, but no, what's, what's cool shit. about it is Please send me, send me a copy of that. I'd love to see. Yeah, that. I will. I'll shoot you a link. We haven't posted it yet, but yeah, cool. we're about to go live with it probably next week. And, but what's that's cool, cool about it is, you know, if you have a good business, like in this case with this company, uh, they'd been in business for about nine years or 10 years or something. And, you know, they've worked out all the issues. They understand who their customer is. They understand how to service that customer, what the pain points are. They know a lot about their customer and they have a good product. Now it's just, yeah. how do we take this to the next level? And that's really where we come in and we know yeah. exactly what to do. We've done it with hundreds yeah. of people and these yeah. little small tweaks can have a massive impact if your company is ready to go. And um, yeah, and that's, so I'm just looking forward to uh, building stronger relationships with other business owners like that and uh, helping them achieve their dreams and, uh, and grow our agency in the process. That's awesome. McGee, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. I, <laughs> it was a pleasure. I mean, we got to do this again soon at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me.